So this video, I want to talk about a few project ideas that I feel can actually become real businesses. The problem with building projects is if you build a project, it's decent for your learning, but no one uses it. And if no one will use it, you won't understand the actual problems that exist in your project. So in this video, let's discuss a few ideas that I feel can become businesses. These all are pain points for me. So if you build some of these, I'll happily be your first customer. And I'm happy to buy like an annual subscription for it. If you price it humbly at like $30, $50 a month, something like that. And if you translate that to, let's say a hundred people, if a hundred people pay $50 a month for your service, that's around $60,000 a year, which is pretty good. And I feel there are at least a hundred people in the world who have this specific problem. Even if nothing monetary comes out of it, I think you'll learn a lot. And if you build a project that people actually want, people use and point out the mistakes in it, you'll understand how projects should be built in a production scenario. With that, let's get right into it. The first one is the one I'm most excited about and I'll happily buy a annual subscription for you if you build it. Here is the problem statement. I have a YouTube channel, but I don't edit any of my videos. All these videos are edited by some other people. And once they're done with it, they send me the final video and I upload it on my YouTube channel. The problem is I am traveling a lot and a bunch of times when I'm traveling, I don't have the right internet to download a 2GB file and then upload it to YouTube. Now YouTube does provide you a way to fix this. You can add other people as editors, but I'm extremely paranoid to do that. So I won't give anyone else access to my channel. This means there's always a manual effort of me coming in, someone sending me a video, me downloading it and uploading it to YouTube. And this is the problem I want to fix. This might sound like a very minor inconvenience, but it is a pretty major inconvenience for me. And this is something I'll happily pay $30, $50 a month for if someone can solve this problem. I think it can be solved in one way, which is um, put a layer in the middle between the editors and Harkirat. The editors sign up on a platform. Harkirat signs up on a platform. Harkirat gives access to his YouTube to the platform and the editors have access to Harkirat's workspace. Anytime a video is finished, an editor can upload it on YouTube, set the title, set the description and upload the video before it goes to a YouTube server. An approval needs to come through Harkirat. So it will be a WhatsApp message for me or a Slack notification. And I need to approve this specific video for it to get uploaded to YouTube, which means the editor is the person who sends a 1GB file to a server. After my approval, the 1GB file goes to the YouTube server. That way I don't have to download the file. And I'm also not paranoid because all things are happening after my approval. If I use YouTube's native editor feature, there is no approval from me in the middle and hence people can upload anything on my YouTube channel, which is something I don't want. Cool. I think the way to build it is fairly straightforward. When a YouTuber comes here, they can sign up and they can give access to their YouTube channel. Their keys are then stored in a database and then the YouTuber can add other people which are like editors and anytime an editor uploads a file here, it stays on your server until the approval. When the approval happens is when you finally send it to YouTube. A few problems I can think of already is does YouTube expose this as an API? I'm not sure. If I had to guess, I would think yes, they would expose uploading as an API. So you'll have to figure out that. The thing about these businesses is, especially YouTube specific businesses is, um, a minor inconvenience can have very high payouts. This happened with StreamYard where everyone kept saying that StreamYard is such a bad business and you know, YouTube can always replace them. But that minor inconvenience of being able to stream directly from a browser ended up becoming a $250 million company. Hence, I have a feeling this is a similar minor inconvenience and YouTube doesn't have the time to fix this. They're working on a bunch of other things and a small business can come here and help a lot of YouTubers out, but you don't have to start there. You can start from a small niche. One of these people being me, if you build this system and it's stable enough, I'll happily use it. If you can go one step further, I'd urge you to either open source this or provide some sort of licenses so people can self host this. If I have my own AWS machine where I can host a service like this, then I have zero paranoia because then my YouTube key is on my own AWS server, which I trust versus if there is a third party service, something that you might build, then my YouTube key is basically with you guys on your server, on your database, wherever. And then I have some paranoia that if your website gets hacked or your backend gets hacked, then my YouTube channel will have random uploads, which is something I don't want. So if you can provide a way to self host it, great. If not, still, I think this is a fairly usable product and I would definitely pay for it. 
with that let's move to the second point the second one i'm calling internationalization as a service so most websites that you look at today might be written in english as in the language of choice on that website is english a few websites let you change the language this is a mildly hard technical problem to solve and the reason is because for the developer of a company that has written everything in english let's say there is a very big uphill battle to find all the strings in your code base that are in english and somehow templateize them so that they can be replaced with chinese hindi so on and so forth so i've seen whenever a company wants to open to new markets and add other languages to their website there is a very high uphill curve for a developer to build this whole internationalization system the second problem is as the website grows new strings keep getting added and when new strings get added you need to convert them to chinese japanese hindi so on and so forth so you need something called translators who help you translate your strings i think both of these can be staggered together to build a business in itself which is okay hey if you are an open source code base our developers or for you it will just be one person okay, i will come to your code base i will add internationalization throughout your code base and i will maintain a list of translators which you can do either via ai or you can hire people from all around the world who will translate strings and take that pain away for a big code base so you go to a company you go to an open source code base and you tell them your website doesn't have internationalization i as the developer will come add internationalization throughout your code base create a single english templates file which contains all the english strings and all translations into chinese japanese hindi i will handle by either translators or via ai and that way you take away that pain point for that company and for the initial uplift of adding internationalization to your code pay me like 1000 to 3000 dollars because it's like an initial effort of 20 to 50 hours that you have to put in to go through their code base and replace all the strings with templates cool that's idea number 2 let's move to the third one this one's called adding open api to your backend so you will still be a service provider like the last service and you'll go to an open source code base or like a company and you'll tell them hey you have a decent backend why not open api for it and that way uh, other people can interact with your backend but more importantly the reason i want to bring this up is because to create a chat gpt plugin or like make chat gpt talk to your own backend you have to expose open api specs that's what chat gpt supports right now unless your backend has very well documented routes what every route does in the open api spec you cannot create a chat gpt plugin right now so i feel eventually all businesses the moat will be just the backend and users might not go to websites they'll just ask chat gpt to do something for example they'll go to chat gpt and write hey buy me stocks for google ads a certain price and this will automatically open a trade on zerodha or whatever exchange they're using hence if this is the exchange they need to expose their backend apis in the open api spec so that chat gpt can talk to it right now this is the only way for chat gpt to talk to your backend and understand what every route does and i feel as more and more people cluster to chat gpt and like general language models these backends are what will remain the moat of businesses and no one will go to websites to access these backends they'll simply ask chat gpt to do something and chat gpt will based on the language model and whatever is written here as to what backend routes do finally call your backend routes and execute the trade or do whatever service your website is doing for that you need to add open api to your backend and that is again another uphill task to do it it's very hard and weird in every language so you can charge a one time fee and your pitch can be okay you can get ahead of your competitors by creating a chat gpt plugin that way your users can simply talk to chat gpt and do things on your backend versus your competitors people still have to go to the website and click buttons that will be your pitch i think you can easily charge 5 to 10k to to do this for a certain company because depending on how big their code base is this will be a uphill task to figure out all the inputs and outputs and what a specific backend route does this is all the things that you sort of put in this very big spec file that is what chat gpt reads and understands what each and every route of yours does all right so uh long story short uh, my mic died when i was recording this video and this is post the edit that i came to know that so the last two points i'm going to talk about here on the board the next point was uh, adding tests to a code base so when you're a startup uh, when you're an open source project a lot of times you have to move really fast so if you look at a bunch of open source projects you'll see they always say tests are welcome or like a uh, much appreciated because the developers don't have the time to write tests and 
even though they have long term benefits in the short term writing tests just takes up a lot of time so you could do one of two things if there is an open source project that does not have tests create the complete testing suite for it and when you do this i think you can charge them up front like a decent amount ke your software developers don't have to worry about tests we will create an independent module that is testing beta unit tests or integration tests and give us an upfront fee and then we'll be out of your business or you could be like ke we will handle your tests from here until eternity which means it will be a recurring business we will charge you based on the number of lines we cover the number of lines of code we write so on and so forth you have just a flat fee of a thousand dollars a month is me any time a developer of your team adds some code we will write some tests and this could also be automated via ai i think um, or at least you can use ai for a lot of help to write these tests so either one of these two and like third one is even if you want to just get hired at a company open source project me agar you, so you see that there is no tests written and the developers of the specific uh, project don't even know or have the time to write tests agar tum aake if you come to the project and write the one the whole boilerplate to set up tests and two add like 50% coverage or more specifically like there was a bug in their company recently and you add a test that tests that specific bug and you tell ke bhaiya ye test if this test was there already this bug would have failed uh, before it got deployed the these things can sort of be impressive factors even if you're applying for a job but this video is specifically for projects that you can charge for so i feel testing as a recurring business is great or adding a one time test to a big project where developers don't have the time to do it is also good one time fee that you can charge will vary from project to project uh, but for a good project i think 2k to 5k or whatever like hourly into like an hourly rate of 20 50 dollars an hour into the number of hours you're putting into write tests i think is a very nice thing for a company to just outsource to someone all right with that let's move to the next one the last point i wanted to talk about and this is a very niche and a very new use case so next js recently not recently like 6 months ago came out with next js 13 it's a uh, significantly better than uh, the previous version and there are a lot of projects out there that haven't yet migrated to it this causes a bunch of issues so this next js 13 specifically has this thing called server side components and client side components if i wouldn't call it a breaking change but they have made a very big change of defining upfront when you are creating your front end components whether it's a whether it should be rendered on the server on the, or on the client not every library has moved to it so you can go to an open source famous library a components framework a ui library and tell them ke i will help you migrate to nexus 13 which basically means it help label their components as client or server side or you could go to a project that hasn't yet moved to the latest app router and still uses the existing one cal.com for example still uses the pages router which is totally fine good and like works very well has worked well for years uh, but eventually at some point companies will migrate to the new app router that nexus has introduced and if that you can pick up as a one time task and you know charge them ke ha this i will do and then i'll leave and then your developers will do their thing as they used to so this also seems like a very necessary use case that a company would very happily outsource for a one time fee so if i was in your shoes and you may or may not do it but i would just do the migration and then ping them ke hey i made this migration if you like it you can pay me something if not that's fine best case like they pay you something worst case you learn something new but this also is a very good learning experience for you to one understand how nextjs 13 applications are written how they're different from nextjs 12 like the previous versions and what is the migration uh, procedure to bring it to the latest version what are server side components what are client side components the new way to fetch things on the back end how they have changed how you can now create asynchronous server side components uh, versus you know sending fetch requests like you used to so a bunch of small things that have changed and these will have long lasting impacts and like these will become the norm eventually in a few years so why not help companies migrate to it um, and and get paid for in the process cool so this was the fifth project um again the goal of this video was ki companies are either not hiring ya tumhe samajh nahi aa raha ki main kaise kusu so why not rather than begging to get hired or like waiting to get hired why not do something that helps the company actually and then whatever you get paid for it is fine i feel some of these can become really good like real businesses especially the youtube one but if you're not yet ready to you know build a business of your own why not start giving services to people and then maybe get paid for it cool with that let's end the video i'll see you in the next one